Well, as we do every week, I encourage you to grab the Pew Bible in front of you, if that would be helpful to follow along with our scripture reading there. If you're at home, I hope you have a Bible handy that you can follow along. Uh, we also have the scripture reading on the cover of your bulletin right next to a page where you can take notes. Uh, again, if that's helpful for you, uh, we'll also have the scripture reading on the screen behind me. Um, our, we're continuing our way through the Sermon on the Mount. We're in Matthew chapter 7 this morning. We're starting to draw near to the end of the sermon. And it's a fairly well-known passage. It's one I think we've all heard before. Uh, it's quoted not just from Scripture, but people refer to it kind of all the time. But what I want you to notice as we read through it is something that's really easy to miss. And that's the humor of this passage. We don't usually think about Jesus being funny. But I think he's at his funniest in this passage. I think he's intentionally using humor to make his point. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the sermon. But I want you to be imagining Jesus saying this with humor uh, to, his, to the crowd that was spread out on the hillside uh, when he first said it. Again, we're in Matthew chapter 7, verses uh, 1 through... Uh, 12. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me, let me uh, take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite! First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. Well, as I said, we're continuing our fall sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we, we have one sermon left next Sunday. So this is the penultimate sermon and uh, if, if everything that I need to know, I learned in kindergarten in order to live my life, then everything that we need to know in order to live as a Christian can be found in the Sermon on the Mount. Simple enough for anyone to understand, yet it takes a lifetime to unpack. The simplicity of the kingdom of God is laid out for us in these few short chapters. Jesus invites all who would follow him to walk this narrow path. Last week we saw that in the pursuit of righteousness, we find that the safest and most secure place to be is in the hands of Jesus. Now back in chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus opened uh, this section on the Sermon on the Mount that, Sermon on the Mount that runs from uh, about halfway through chapter 5 all the way through chapter 6 through the first half of chapter 7 by saying, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then at the end of our reading this morning in verse 12, as we just saw, he wraps up this section when he says, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. If you want to fulfill the law and the prophets, if you want to know everything to know about the law and the prophets, then read everything in between those two sentences. Everything we need to know about being obedient about being a disciple of Jesus Christ, about what it takes to fulfill what God wants us to do, what God wants for us. In short, 
everything that we need to know in order to hunger and thirst after righteousness has been contained for us in these chapters. But there's a a hidden danger, a hidden risk in this pursuit, and that risk is the trap of self-righteousness. Our passage this morning, as Jesus concludes the teaching portion of the Sermon on the Mount, provides the necessary safeguards to keep us from falling into that trap. As we work through our passage this morning, we will see that the evidence of our pursuit of the righteousness of Jesus Christ is found in how we treat those around us. As we prepare to hear from the word of the Lord this morning, let us take a moment to pray. Lord God, there is a desire in our hearts to be righteous, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. But it is so easy to slip into self-righteousness without even realizing it. This morning, Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to come into our hearts, to soften the areas where we are hard, to clear away our blind spots that keep us from seeing our own self-righteousness, to help us to see our Savior, Jesus Christ, more clearly, to hear the soft sound of his sandaled feet, to follow him in the ways that you have made possible for us to do. This morning, Lord, may all that we say and all that we do be for you and for your glory. It is in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Well, as we have said repeatedly throughout this series, the heart of the Sermon on the Mount can be found in the middle, the heart of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Throughout the sermon, Jesus is explaining what being righteous truly means, how we are to hunger and thirst for it, and how the righteousness of Christ truly satisfies the deepest needs and yearnings of the human soul. But we are broken and fallen people, are we not? The stain of sin has bent and corrupted us to the very, very core. And that becomes particularly true when we talk about pursuing righteousness. As the word of God declares in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. It is only because of and through Jesus Christ that we are even able to desire pursuing righteousness. A little bit later in the same chapter, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Jesus Christ is the one who has made it possible for us to pursue righteousness because he has paid the price for our unrighteousness, our sinfulness. But even still, even with that, on this side of glory, it is a constant struggle For us, even though Christ has made it possible for us to want to be righteous like he is, sin is still present in our lives, bending and twisting our desire. As Martin Luther famously said, we are at once just and sinful. This lifelong tension for the Christian is expressed so perfectly at the end of Romans chapter 7. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me 
from this body of death. Of course, the very next verse, chapter 8, opens with, Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, there are three uh, particular ways that sin bends and distorts our understanding of what it means to be righteous. Uh, The first way that sin bends this is through self-righteousness. Now, in the first half of chapter 6, when Jesus talks about fasting and prayer and giving, he addresses a form of self-righteousness that comes through trying to look or act more righteous than everyone else. The other side of that coin comes through trying to make everyone else look less righteous than you are. So on the one hand, the beginning of chapter 6 is looking at how we try to make ourselves look more righteous than everyone else, but that's really hard and gets kind of tiring, right? It's really easy, however, to make everyone else look less righteous. And if everyone else looks worse, then I I look better, right? Right? The worse everyone else looks, the more righteous I appear. So we go around pointing out everyone else's failures and flaws, which again has a dual benefit. It's kind of a win-win, right? Because on the one hand, you make them feel a lot worse about themselves, and you make yourself feel so much better about you, right? Really, it's a win-win, except not at all. The second way righteousness gets bent is through what you might call overcooked righteousness. In this situation, I start to think that I am so good at being righteous that everyone else needs the pearls of righteous wisdom that I am glad to bestow upon them. It doesn't matter if they want or even remotely interested in these gems of righteous truth, it is for their own good, and one day they will thank me for it, even if they don't right now. Really, really, it's just a good thing for their sake that I'm in their life to guide them in their lost ways, because otherwise they would be so lost without me. I'm really, I'm just trying to be a servant. Just trying to help you poor, unfortunate soul on your way. The third bend is is a punitive form of righteousness. This is the mentality that it is only through deprivation or punishment that righteousness can be formed. It's, It's a kind of righteousness that says the beatings will continue until morale improves. I love it. It withholds good gifts and praise because that would be to spoil the person. They'll they'll just end up taking it for granted. I worked with a guy once uh, who told me when he did employee evaluations, it was a simple three-point scale. Uh, One was needs improvement. Two was meets expectation. Three was exceeds expectations. He said, as a matter of principle, I never give out a three. Ever. Won't do it. I want people to keep thinking they got to work harder. And I'm like, wow, you're a jerk. (laughs) Right? I mean, that's really kind of the way that it was just so terrible. It made me so sad. But but it's grounded in a proverb, spare the rod, spoil the child. Right? Alas, that quote is so close to Proverbs 13, 24, and yet so far from it as well. That is a complete misapplication of the importance of godly discipline and correction. As much as Jesus is inviting us to hunger and thirst for righteousness, he also wants to help us avoid the broken and bent righteousness toward which sin is constantly trying to lead us. As Jesus begins to bring the Sermon on a Mount to a close, he provides us with three safeguards to protect us from the traps of self-righteousness. The guiding principle for these safeguards is found in verse 12, what we often refer to as the golden rule. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. 
This is less a rule and frankly, more just a simple fact of life. What goes up must come down. The seed you sow is the plant you grow. In fact, that is the very analogy that the Apostle Paul uses in Galatians 6 when he writes, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. It's as simple as it sounds. It's not complicated at all. Treat other people the way you want to be treated. But there's an implicit, there is an implicit lesson embedded in the golden rule. And throughout the New Testament, yes, treat others the way you want to be treated, but even more, treat others the way God has treated you. Colossians 3.13, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Luke 6.36, be merciful just as your father is merciful. John 13.34, as I have loved you, you must love one another. One might go so far as to say that the golden rule is what God has done for you, go and do that for others. This undergirds everything that Jesus is saying in these verses. The golden rule helps us avoid the traps of self-righteousness by encouraging us to consider how we would like to be treated. Instead of self-righteously judging people, be humble and gracious. Instead of sharing unsolicited and unwanted advice, be judicious. Instead of depriving others, be generous. And to make his point, as we said at the beginning of the scripture reading, Jesus uses a lot of humor. The first safeguard against self-righteousness is to be humble and gracious. Jesus says, judge not, that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye but do not notice the log that is in your own. Do you ever stop to imagine this when you read these words? To picture somebody with a speck in their eye and then you with a log coming out of your own? I mean, okay, that's kind of gross, really weird, but also hilarious to think about, right? Now, it's important to note what Jesus is not saying. And he is not saying that we should never correct someone when they are doing wrong. Scripture repeatedly encourages us to hold one another accountable, to call out sin when and where we see it, to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. What Jesus is saying here, though, is that before you go around pointing out the wrong in someone else, Check your own heart first. Self-righteousness and pride point out the wrongs in others while refusing to see the wrongs in oneself. It takes humility to admit that we also struggle with the sins that we see in others. In what might be a touch of convicting irony, usually the sins we are most eager to point out in other people are the very sins that we struggle with the most ourselves. If you find yourself regularly and repeatedly calling out the same sin in other people, you might want to do a heart check first to see if that's a sin you are struggling with yourself. When we humbly own, confess, and repent of our own sins, then we are able to approach other people with grace rather than condemnation. That's what Jesus is encouraging us to do here, as he says in verse 5. You hypocrite! First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. We avoid self-righteous condemnation when we strive to be humble and gracious. 
The second safeguard against overcooked righteousness is to be judicious. Now, this next verse is, I think, one of the hardest verses in the Bible to understand. Jesus says, do not give to dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. It's jarring. Because hasn't Jesus just told us not to judge others? And yet here he is turning around and seems to be calling other people dogs and pigs, which I'm pretty confident it's not a compliment. It's confusing because it's really unclear what this verse has to do with the preceding verses or the ones that come after it. In fact, a lot of commentators, commentaries that I read on this said, yeah, this kind of came out of nowhere. It has nothing to do with what came before, nothing to do with what comes after. I'm like, I think Jesus is a little better at public speaking than that. It's unsettling. Because we just don't know what's meant by the images that are being used here. All of them, dogs, pigs, trampling, attacking. What is this about? Now, a lot of interpreters today think that this passage means that we shouldn't keep trying to share the gospel, the pearls of the gospel, with people who are, who are only going to trample on and reject it. They're not going to hear it. They repeatedly keep not hearing it, so just stop trying. The early church said that this, was, this meant that we shouldn't serve the, uh, the pearls, the holy things of communion to non-believers, which I'm like, wow, that's an amazing reach because I don't read anything in there that has anything to do with the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. It's weird, right? What is going on here? And I, I do think there's an element of truth really to both of those, the, the idea that, you know, there are just some people whose hearts are so hard to the gospel that no, you, you've tried to share the gospel with them and all they've done is trample on it and it's time to just kick the dust off your sandals and move on. Jesus tells the disciples that, right? But I don't really think that's what's going on here. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think that this is one of the many examples of Jesus using instructive irony with a touch of humor to make his point. Think about it. The previous passage is funny. You have a log coming out of your eye, right? The next passage, he says, who of you, if your son asks for bread, is going to give him a rock? Come on, that's funny. Why would he stop being funny in the middle, right? And I think it's instructive binary. Imagine reading these words and imagining a, a slight inflection, on holy and pearls, a little bit of an, of an ironic twinkle in Jesus' eye and a curl of his lip, a slight sideways smile as he says it. As we said before, overcooked righteousness is when we think we are obligated to share our gems of righteous wisdom with those who are clearly not as fortunate as we are to be as wise. Have you ever had a positive experience with someone sharing unsolicited advice with you? When you were raising your kids and your child throws a tantrum in the middle of the grocery store, you've always appreciated that person who walks up and says, you know, you really should do right in the middle. That's like, thank you so much. Your timing was just perfect. I really want to smack you right now, right? Nobody likes that. I don't know about you, it rarely goes well for me the times I try to offer unsolicited advice. Now, while perhaps not as viscerally as Jesus paints the picture, the person that I try to give my unsolicited advice to usually does that very thing. They trample all over my well-intentioned advice and end up turning around and attacking me with it. Maybe that's not been your experience. It's always been mine. What you think are precious pearls of wisdom, I am so sorry to say, not really, probably aren't as precious or as wise as you think they are. And the unfortunate soul before you is probably more fortunate than you give them credit for being in the moment. Brothers and sisters, be judicious in the correction and advice that you offer. There is a time and a place for everything. Most likely, this moment, whatever the moment is, isn't that time and place, particularly if they haven't asked for your advice. 
We avoid overcooked righteousness when we are judicious and discerning with others. The third safeguard against punitive righteousness is to be generous. Continuing to salt and season his words with humor, Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Pretty straightforward, right? The humor comes next and it's fantastic. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? And if he asks for a fish, would give him a serpent? If you then, if you, if you who are evil know how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? There are so many people who think, like I said earlier, that we're not allowed to make personal requests of God. That we can only pray for others, but not ourselves. I just, I just don't get how we can think that. When there are verses in passages like this, our God is a God of abundant, overflowing generosity and grace. All we have to do is ask. And God will always, Answer your prayers abundantly. Always hear and answer abundantly. Not necessarily the way you want him to answer, but in a way that will be so much better. Better for you. Better for those around you. Better for his glory and his kingdom. I don't know, I don't really know where the idea comes from that the path to generosity and gratitude comes through deprivation and punishment. It's such a backwards, twisted way for us to understand grace and mercy and the purpose of discipline and correction. Discipline and correction are gifts that God has given us, that we need. But we've twisted it so much. Brothers and sisters, God has been abundantly generous with you. So share that generosity with others. It, it's such a basic thing. Even we, as broken and twisted by sin as we are, know to give our children bread and fish, not stones and snakes, right? I think everybody on the same page on that. If not, talk to me afterward. Don't raise your hand right now. How much more so with God? We avoid punitive righteousness when we are intentional in being generous with others. As the old saying goes, you attract more flies with honey than with vinegar. I know there are some who disagree with me on this, but man, I cannot stand the smell of vinegar at all. Being self-righteous treating others with condescending, overcooked righteousness or judgmental, punitive righteousness isn't going to draw people into the kingdom of God. It's just going to invite them to treat us the same way. Instead, be humble and gracious. Be judicious and be generous with others. It really is as simple as Jesus says. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Even more, treat others the way God has treated you. May God bless each one of us in the days and weeks to come as we demonstrate the evidence of our pursuit of the righteousness of Jesus Christ through the humble and gracious, judicious, and generous ways we treat others. Amen. Would you please bow your heads with me? Lord, we do confess to you the ways that we do tend to bend and twist the righteousness you've called us to live. It's so hard. It's so simple. It's so easy to understand. It's so hard to do and to do consistently. 
much as even our desire to be righteousness is a gift of grace from you to us. Would you extend your grace? Would you fill us with your spirit to enable us to truly hunger and thirst for your righteousness by treating others the way that we want to be treated and the way you have treated us? It is a gift of grace that you have given to us. It is a gift of grace you invite us to share with others. And it all begins, Lord, with our surrendering to you. All we are, all we want, even all we need. It is in that place of surrender that we find your presence and your grace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.